Recently, Dr. William Lane Craig posted a short note on his Facebook page. Yeah, he's got a Facebook page. Uh, and in this note, he purported to refute what he called another hopelessly bad objection to the Kalam argument. Now, this objection came in the form of a syllogism consisting of premises and a conclusion entitled the Kalam argument against the existence of God. And it came to Dr. Craig as a submission to his question of the week blog on the Reasonable Faith website. Uh, and even more recently, Dr. Craig has referred to this syllogism again on Reasonable Faith, this time in response to a different but related question. Um, I provided a link to the syllogism and both of Dr. Craig's brief responses to it below. And I highly recommend that you take a look at that, pause this video maybe, um, just so you're up to speed on the material I'm about to cover. So go ahead, I'll wait. Okay, done waiting, let's move on. Here's the thing about this hopelessly bad objection. I wrote it, it's mine, verbatim. Uh, and it comes from a video I did here on YouTube entitled, I Kalam Like I See Him. But uh, the syllogism you see, the one Dr. Craig represents in his blog as my hopelessly bad objection, wasn't actually my objection at all. It was more like a cute little tongue-in-cheek accessory to my objection, thrown in at the very end of a 13-minute video exploring the nature of existence, causality, and myriology, totally stripped of its context. So, you yeah, know, so much for all my hard work, right? Uh, now, the worst case scenario, obviously, is that Dr. Craig himself made the conscious decision not only to keep my words liberated from their proper context, but to withhold from his audience the source of the very objection to which he was responding, a source which would have illuminated just how misleading Craig's treatment really was. But even if that's not what happened, even if this is a case of, say, the dumbest atheist in the universe submitting this syllogism to Dr. Craig thinking it would stump him as a standalone argument, or maybe one of Dr. Craig's loyal fans coming across my objection and deciding to pass along only the decontextualized version of it. The point is, you would think Dr. Craig would decline to comment on an argument without an understanding of what the premises are in fact referring to and how they're supported. I mean, take the Kalam argument itself. Two simple premises and a conclusion. That's it, right? And yet Craig has devoted a 224-page book to supporting the premises of this syllogism. Imagine, just imagine how easily this argument would have been laughed off the academic stage had no one of scholarly repute been afforded the opportunity to elaborate upon it. Heck, the argument doesn't even conclude with God's existence. I mean, throw that one out with all the other pop internet trash. Am I right? Am I right? Huh? High five! No? But even more so, if the syllogism from my video were truly the comically absurd rhetorical junkyard Craig claims it to be, why is he wasting so much time drawing attention to it? Guy gets 100 Q&A submissions a week, and this hopelessly bad, supposedly anonymous pop objection from the internet is the one he finds most pressing? Come on. After all, Craig himself claims, and I quote, I read scholarly criticisms of my work but I tend to ignore popular stuff on the internet since I figure the internet critics are not likely to say anything of substance that the scholars have missed." End quote. I mean, this is at least an understandable principle, albeit snobby and cynical, so long as Craig actually stood by it. But he doesn't ignore popular arguments on the internet. On the contrary, Craig has made a hobby of regularly drawing attention to arguments presented by the YouTube community and other forums, distorting them to a point of unrecognizability while conveniently leaving their authors and sources anonymous, and then tearing those mischaracterizations to shreds with a nearly uncomfortable degree of condescension and mockery. I mean, it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy, isn't it? And if you begin with the assumption that certain critics are so unsophisticated and ignorant that their arguments should, at face value, be given the least charitable interpretation possible, you've already predestined those arguments to confirm your prejudice. Right? In any intellectual or academic community, there is a courtesy extended to those of opposing views, especially once we make the commitment to engage them in discourse. And that courtesy is the honest attempt to represent their objections as fairly and generously as possible before taking them on. Not only is this the ethical thing to do, it's efficient. It saves us the time and embarrassment of having to correct our own straw man fallacies. But it would almost seem that, that Dr. Craig believes he's not only justified, but entitled to treat non-scholarly objections with a dismissive carelessness and uncharitability that he wouldn't dare subject his academic peers to, at least in principle. And I, for one, think that's remarkably disingenuous. 
Now let me say really briefly that my good friend Theo Warner has written uh, a, a very eloquent piece discussing the ethics of discourse in academia, uh, especially as it pertains to Dr. Craig and his apologetics. Uh, and I highly recommend you check that out. I will provide the link in the description box. But let's be honest, I'm not doing myself any favors by scolding William Lane Craig for his debate etiquette. That's not how to get his attention. And as it happens, his attention is exactly what I'm after here. So here's what I'd like to do. I'm going to use up the rest of this video to re-present my actual objection to the Kalam argument. And this time, hopefully, I won't be leaving any room for ambiguity or misinterpretation. And in fact, I confess, the more I reflect upon the video I did that originally spawned all of this, I'm secretly grateful that Craig hasn't directly addressed it yet, because now I, I really think I can do a much better job of articulating the concepts therein. I'm also going to approach it from a slightly different angle, and I think that'll help too. And then, if you find me worthy, uh, I'd like for you all to do me a huge favor. Get the word out to Craig. Flood the Reasonable Faith website with reminders that despite two attempts, he has yet to accurately address this argument. Send him a link to this video, you know, send him uh, the complete transcript. If you own a channel and you can mirror this video, oh my god, that would be amazing. There's power in numbers, and if we cultivate enough demand for Dr. Craig to give this argument the consideration that I believe it deserves, maybe he will. After all, it is his job. Above all else, William Lane Craig is an apologist, which literally translates to defending his position against criticism. But he can't do that until he knows what the criticism actually is. So let's get started. Anything material we've ever seen come into existence, babies, sculptures, cars, has been a reconfiguration of previously existing material which was once not that thing. This matters because the only way we've ever seen causality work is in the form of actions and reactions between stuff which already exists. We've never seen something which doesn't exist caused to begin existing. Things which don't exist can't be caused to do anything, since they aren't there to be influenced by a cause. You may be thinking, well, that, that's absurd. A carpenter obviously causes a previously non-existent table to begin existing. Uh, but mm, no, not, <laughs> not in any literal sense. I mean, to say that a carpenter caused a table to exist is more or less a figure of speech, and it's a misleading one at that. The carpenter didn't cause the table to do anything since the table didn't exist yet. What the carpenter did do was cause material, which was not the table, to become the table. This is how the table comes into existence, when non-table material is assembled by the carpenter into a table. But if what you're acting upon, if what you're causally affecting is already a table, then the table existed before you ever got to it, and thus you didn't cause it to begin existing. After all, what is a table? Well, it's a certain combination of different material, wood, nails, lacquer, none of which is a table in itself. What is a baby? A baby is a combination of different material, bone, tissue, cells, none of which is a baby in itself. William Lane Craig has argued this exact point many times, so he shouldn't find it all too controversial. So when we say that babies or tables are caused to exist, what we're really referring to is the phenomenon of non-baby, non-table material being reassembled into babies and tables. You can't causally affect a baby before it's a baby. No baby exists yet, only an egg and sperm. But that sperm can be made to affect that egg, causing them to assemble into a baby. This is how children and any other material thing come into existence, so far as we've ever observed. In the past, Dr. Craig has responded to a misleadingly literal understanding of this very simple observation, claiming that atheists on the internet, quote, say nothing ever begins to exist, because everything has material out of which it's constituted, and those atoms and particles existed before the thing did, and so nothing ever begins to exist, and the first premise is false. And I think, what is the matter with these people? Have I always existed? Didn't I begin to exist at the moment, say, when my father's sperm and my mother's egg came into union?" End quote. He goes on to say, It's just irrational, and yet people think that refutes the premise that whatever begins to exist has a cause when it doesn't do so at all. So I'm just utterly bewildered by how people are taken in by this lack of rigorous thinking. Well, you know, I have to concede that if I actually thought this is what the objection was, uh, I would be just as bewildered as Dr. Craig. But happily, nobody on YouTube or anywhere else is actually saying this. Um, so no, Dr. Craig, you did not always exist. But the only way you could have begun to 
is if previously existing stuff was caused to reassemble into you. Your parents did not cause you to magically pop into existence out of nothingness, nor has anything else in the observable world begun to exist in this way. And yet, yet, this is exactly how you think the universe came into being. And how did you arrive at that conclusion? Because to propose that a being caused the universe to begin existing should infer, so far as we understand causality to work, that non-universe material was reassembled in such a way as to become the universe. That's the only way we've ever seen things come into existence, so that would obviously be the most parsimonious explanation. But this is not what you're proposing. You believe that God brought the universe into being without ever having caused anything of any kind to become the universe. This stuff from which the universe was made, you believe, was literally non-existent. There was no stuff. There was only an utter absence of any material or substance to act upon. You believe that all of the stuff of which the universe is composed just popped into existence out of nothing, and that God somehow facilitated this event. So the criticism, the real criticism, is that we have two distinct concepts here, two very different notions of what it means to come into existence, which are being fallaciously conflated by Dr. Craig. One, something caused to come into being wholly separate from previously existing stuff, i.e. creatio ex nihilo, or creation from nothing. And two, something caused to come into being not wholly separate from previously existing stuff, i.e. creatio ex materia, or creation from material. Now bear in mind that nobody anywhere ever has verifiably observed the former. Something coming into existence ex nihilo is 100% conjecture. We've only ever seen things begin to exist ex materia from previous stuff. So how would we know that if something ever began to exist ex nihilo, it would have a cause? Well, we don't. We know that things that begin to exist ex materia have a cause, and that's all we know. But Craig is plainly and explicitly arguing that the universe was caused by God to come into existence from nothingness. In other words, Craig is arguing that the universe is an example of one, not two. And yet, how does Craig attempt to demonstrate this? Amusingly, he does so by citing examples of two instead of one. Astonishingly, he regularly uses the beginning of his own existence as an example. That's weird. Now what do you suppose <laughs> what do you suppose would happen if we were to factor this profound distinction back into the Kalam argument? Premise one, whatever begins to exist from previously existing material has a cause, this much we know. Premise two, the universe began to exist, but not from any previously existing material. Conclusion, therefore the universe has a cause. Mm, that's an invalid argument conclusion does not follow from the premises. Now one response I can anticipate to this is that even though we have no empirical evidence we can point to in support of ex nihilo requiring a cause, it just seems intuitively true, you know, because it seems more plausible than the alternative, something coming into existence ex nihilo uncaused. It just, it's just easier to picture in your head, right? I mean, well, I'd say the repeatedly demonstrable failure of our intuitions to grasp matters of physics is enough to dismiss this complaint outright, but my objection to the Kalam argument goes a step further. I believe I can make a positive case that creatio ex nihilo, creation of something from nothing, is a mythical phenomenon, that it is less plausible than its alternative. Because not only is it unsupported by evidence, it requires us to commit the fallacy of redefining causality into meaningless incoherency in order to save creationism from being falsified ad hoc. There's only two ways you can meaningfully look at this as a causal event. Now, if we're talking about a state of affairs in which the universe doesn't exist yet, you can't say that God caused the universe to do anything, such as start existing, because there is no universe. That's absurd. The only thing God is capable of causally influencing is existent, non-universe stuff, in the same way that a carpenter can only causally influence existent, non-table stuff in order to create a table. What existent, non-universe stuff was available for God to causally influence? Well, according to Craig, there was nothing. God literally caused nothing to become the universe, or to put it more accurately, God didn't cause anything to become the universe. Nothing, after all, is the absence of anything by definition. So we can't say that God 
caused the universe to begin existing in any literal sense because that's absurd and we can't say that God caused nothing to become the universe in any literal sense which is equally absurd so what does the good doctor mean exactly when he says that God was the cause of the beginning of the universe well it turns out Craig doesn't actually know what he means any more than I know what he means. All he knows is that he wants to attribute the universe's existence to the deity of his particular religion somehow. It's like the reasoning seems to be that we have this moment at which the universe doesn't exist, and then we have this other moment at which the universe does exist, and then we have God existing at both of these moments, and therefore God must be causally responsible for this change in states of affairs. I'm sorry, that doesn't follow. Simply being present for a change in states of affairs does not establish something as the efficient cause of that change. If you're going to assert that the universe began to exist at a finite point and came into existence from nothing, and that God caused this event to happen, you actually have to demonstrate that God caused it. And unfortunately, we've already ruled out any meaningful way in which that could possibly be the case. Now let me digress for a moment just to be perfectly clear about what it is that I am and am not arguing. I do not claim to know whether the universe began to exist at a finite point or whether this is even a sensical question to ask in light of our advancements in physics. The point I am making is that even if the universe began to exist ex nihilo and God was present for this change in states of affairs, God cannot have been the efficient cause in any logically intelligible way. For causality to take place, you must have interaction. Think of any causal event and you'll find that there are always three necessary elements. A, something exerting causal influence, that which is doing the causing, the effector. B, something being influenced, that which the effector is acting upon, the affected. And C, that which results from the interaction of A and B, the effect. Now go ahead and mull this over, you know, test it out in your own head for a minute. See if you can come up with an instance of causality in the real world in which all three of these elements are not present. I mean, does it even make sense to posit a causal event without an A, a B, and a C? Because this is exactly what creationism postulates. I mean, in, in the case of God creating the universe ex nihilo, we go right from A to C. Skipping B altogether, the most important part, you know, the part where something gets causally influenced. Dr. Craig believes there was literally nothing at all for God to causally influence. This is no different from admitting that God didn't causally influence anything. And that is no different from admitting that God didn't cause anything. So remember that syllogism I mentioned in the beginning, the one Dr. Craig called another hopelessly bad objection? Um, Let's wrap this video up by taking another look at that uh, with fresh eyes. And this time I will, I will amend some of my language just so certain satirically challenged people can't run amok with it like last time. Now I've spent this entire video, half of the video, arguing for the first premise. So let's go from there. Premise one, nothing which exists can cause something which does not exist to begin existing ex nihilo. Premise two, given one, Anything which begins to exist ex nihilo was not caused to do so by something which exists. Premise three, the universe began to exist ex nihilo. Premise four, given two and three, the universe was not caused to exist by anything which exists. Premise five, God is defined as a being which caused the universe to begin to exist ex nihilo. Conclusion, given four and five, God does not exist by definition. Now, a while back, I made a video called Clarifying Kalam Craziness, all spelled with K's. Clever, I know. Uh, and I made, I made that as a follow-up video to uh, the one in which I first presented this argument. And the idea was to unpack my reasoning behind each step of the syllogism. For example, a lot of people thought my third premise was an endorsement of the second premise in the original Kalam argument. And it's not. It, it's about forcing the theist into a position of having to choose their battles. So I strongly, strongly recommend checking that video out, especially if you have any intention of responding to this, or if something about this syllogism doesn't jive for you. That said, uh, thank you to my subscribers for your patience with me. I know I've taken a long hiatus from video making. And to Dr. Craig, 
If you ever do watch this video in its entirety, I know it's a long video, I want to express my appreciation for that. And while I'm confident that at this point in your career, no criticism ever could or would persuade you to abandon your arguments or your position, my wish is that you would come to appreciate this objection as one that merits a thoughtful response. Be well.